Good afternoon. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place, the Massachusetts and the Wampanoag peoples, and pay my respect to their elders, past, present, and future. Hello, welcome to Boston and to Emerson College. Thank you for being here. <laughs> uh, I'm Jamie Galoon. I am the director and a co-founder of HowlRound Theater Commons. And my pronouns are she, her, hers. HowlRound is a free and open platform for theater makers worldwide that amplifies progressive and disruptive ideas about the art form and connects diverse practitioners. HowlRound is organized as a commons, which is a social structure that invites participation along shared values. At HowlRound, we value generosity and abundance, community and collaboration, diverse aesthetics, equity, inclusivity, accessibility, and global citizenship. While much of our platform exists online, we know that there's no replacement for in-person conversation. Since our founding in 2011, we have produced over 20 convenings on a wide range of topics with a combined attendance of over 1,000 theater makers. In April 2017, in the wake of the presidential election, we announced an open call for convening proposals called the HowlRound Challenge. We asked the field to submit ideas for the most urgently needed conversations that demanded in-person gatherings with the idea that we could purpose our resources toward trying to make a better theater and a better world. We got over 70 proposals, and out of these proposals, the Deaf Theater Action Planning Session proposed by Ty Giordano, Rachel Grossman, DJ Kurse, and Ethan Sinnott was chosen as one of the four convenings. And over the past year plus, yes. <laughs> over the past year plus, HowlRound has had the pleasure of co-organizing this gathering. It is extremely important to us that what happens over the next three days is shared with the field at large. We were able to bring all of you here in person 
but there are so many more people that we wish could be in this room. So we're asking you to be delegates in this experience and to bring the learning and the conversations we have here back to your communities and networks. We're doing our part to make this convening accessible by live streaming most of it on HowlRound TV. People can tune in online in real time, like right now, <laughs> or they can access the video archive shortly after the event. In addition to video documentation, We'll be taking photos and publishing an official convening report to be authored by Jill Bradbury. In the coming months. <laughs> This gathering would not be possible without the amazing HowlRound team. Producer Ramona Ostrowski and associate producer Stokely, who have been leaders in co-organizing this event and tireless in their pursuit of excellence. <laughs> HowlRound cultural strategist Vijay Matthew who is holding down our video and live streaming ship over here. <laughs> uh, Latinx Theater Commons producer, Abigail Vega. HowlRound fellow, Dylan Uruegas. And our cadre. and our cadre of volunteers, Ross, Emma, Rachel, and Allie. I'd also like to thank, oh. I'd also like to thank the production team who's supporting us, John, Swati, and Andre. If you're a part of this convening producing team, will you please stand if you're able or raise your hand so we can all thank you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I'd also like to introduce Charles Baldwin from the Mass Cultural Council, who is joining us as an observer this weekend. Can you stand? In closing, I'd like to thank the Barr Foundation without whom this event would not be possible. I'd also like to thank Boston University for their support. As well as the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts. And now, last but not least, it's my great pleasure and honor to hand it over to the organizing team 
who identified a need for this convening and committed themselves to making it happen. Please welcome Ty, Rachel, DJ, Patty, Ethan, and Alexandria, who will lead us from here on out. Thank you. I feel like I'm in the Olympics. You want to go next? Hi, everyone, and welcome. This is so exciting that we're convening here. I'm Alexandria Wales. You'll be interacting with us for three days, so you'll see a lot of me and the other individuals, and we are so inspired by everyone coming here together. We look forward to the entire weekend being with you. Hello, everyone. I'm DJ. I'm from California, Deaf West Theater. I'm excited to be here at this event this weekend, and I am also looking forward to this weekend with you guys. I'm Patty Lang. I'm the director of Deaf Spotlight in DC. Happy to be with all of you for this weekend. Go theater. Hello, everyone. Ethan Senate, that is who I am. I am a designing direct director, producer, and I am out of Washington, D.C., and I am really inspired to see a wealth of collection of artists here at this weekend. I look forward to the next three days. Hello, I am Rachel Grossman. I am so honored to be here. Thank you for permitting me to be with you. Hello, everyone. I'm Tyrone, Tyrone Calvary, Joe Giovanno. It's been a long time coming before we got here, and I am thrilled that it is finally happening. And this is just the beginning, folks. Just the beginning. There's more to come. Thank you for all coming in attendance today. Thank you. So we'll begin with a, a ritual of a sort. Uh, we asked you to bring some artifact, uh, something personal. Uh, we're going to take a couple of minutes to prepare the next part of this. So uh, reach into your bags, pull out your personal item, your artifact, and get ready for the next part of the session.
If anyone has forgotten to bring anything or some hair clippers or something, I'll take a strand of your hair. Before we proceed, I would like to talk a little bit about why we're here. You know, deaf theater, actors, we've been planning, you know, what's the purpose of this event, you're probably wondering. Why we flew in from all across the country. You know, to take the time to work out, you know, the schedule and the money that's been invested for this. For what purpose, you may be asking yourselves. The goal is outcomes. You know, planning to find out what the outcomes and how we can improve and how we can grow the industry and the landscape of the deaf theater and also deaf artists, and the opportunity for us to discuss this as a group because we can move forward with a vision so that we can change how we can be the change. We are the beginning of this change, which begins right here. Now, I've gone to other events and gatherings similar to this where we've had little forums, we discussed these things, and then they dissolved and nothing came about it. So now we decided to say that it's been over a year and we've been meeting on a regular basis planning this specific event. We wanted to find out what other milestones we could look for and look at what's going on in other theaters and other parts of the country and how they're getting growth and how they're developing and creating more opportunities in terms of writers and plays and scripts. So we're starting to take you know, a collection of ideas and stuff and see how things are working and so we want to gather all these people together, which is the hardest part, because now I have to be very selective of who I can invite to this event. But ultimately, we picked you people because of the fact that you are in a position of change. And you are the ones that are going to be making this change and become leaders in this industry. Producers, directors, writers, educators. We all together are in a position where we can make things happen. And we need more deaf theater. And right here with the people among us, we can make this happen. And this is why you were chosen. And I know that many of you who have been with us that are not here, there are many that are not, wish that you could be. But we can take this information back to where we come from and spread this information and then have more inclusion through social media and live streaming. So we can continue this conversation way beyond this event. I have an agenda. We're going to elaborate on that a little later on. And in this agenda, we hope that we're going to design with the purpose of having clear information before we leave in terms of how we can actually put this plan into place and how we can start network networking with each other and building a bridge for the future. I also recognize that historically, you know, traditionally deaf theater, and when we speak about the landscape of it, it's been shifting. We have more of a diverse background. Now we have deaf blind theater, and that is also going to become part of our legacy. And so we want to discuss how we can sp support that vision as well. ASL theater in itself historically has started back in the 1950s, 1960s to the present. But professional theater, like what we know it is now, really started 50 years ago with the National Theater of the Deaf through the 70s. So it's well over 30 years. So we're still in its infancy. So we have so much more to grow and develop as we expand the future of our industry. I'd like to bring Alexandria up to the stage, please. Hello. So I want to go along with what was just said. Um, we're pretty young and as a professional theater group, and there are many, many individuals we want to honor and recognize from the history to now and going forward as well. 
So maybe some of the names that we will recognize you haven't really been aware of. And we want to make sure that every individual is respected equally and recognize those. So hold those thoughts in your heart. Hold them in your heart and in your minds. So as we expand on this, they will carry us forward. They're going to do this. We will do this together, and that will help us move forward. <laughs> amen. Someone just said amen. <laughs> so let's go on to what we have um, our goals for this, this, wor this uh, session. We have an altar, and you're, this is your personal journey. So you are bringing things creatively to professional theater. You are bringing yourself here. So take your object and think about who gave that to you or how you got that and how that represents you. So make a, a very conscious connection to that. And then hold on to that. Remember it. Remember who taught you and where that information came from. Are we speaking about the Wampanoag? We were speaking about the Wampanoag tribe and think about the language that we have and the culture and the community and how it might have gotten smaller and now is going to expand again through the darkness that language, that culture, that oppression that we've had, we've, everyone has fought so strongly. We are now going to do that altar to remind you this weekend and moving forward to put what we honor and love so much in our history so that this is a sacred space we are bringing this to. So all of you have something, and what we're going to ask you to do now is to bring that to the table. This is the altar that we're going to put the things that represent us on. I'll demonstrate. So again, I'm Alexandria. I prefer she, her for pronouns. I come from New York City. And this is a script of our town. My first deaf mentor, Michael Lamatola, is represented. So Mike Lamatola. So I'm going to ask each person to come up and share. So you can see me, <laughs> can you, in the background on the big screen. And it's really important that everyone has a visual and can see the sight lines. So we will hand that over. We'll finger, if you finger spell something, please do it at a pace that we can see and read clearly. I'm DJ, and my pronouns are he, him, and his. This is a ticket from Bernard Bragg for the Death Theater, and I uh, received that back in Washington, D.C., and I brought that with me. It's a momentum. We were good friends, and, we were ch and he was the trailblazer, and it's very personal to me. Next. I'm Rachel Grossman. She, her, and hers are my preferred pronouns. I come from DC. And that little clown red nose I just showed you, I brought it for two reasons. Separated at birth was the show that it, I was used, it was used in as a part of the costume. The company's dog and pony. That 
That was the first time they had a deaf actor. That was Marley Matlin, and she was in that performance. That red clown nose really, really taught me how to interact with the audience. And that was one of the best things of my life, how to do that. Here's my clown nose. I know there are some questions here, so please come and ask the questions. Sure. There's a question from the audience to see whether or not participants can bring their altar object to the deafblind participants, and then we can have them placed back on the altar. So would that resolve if they put it on the altar and then you were able to come up and get a sense of what it feels like after? No, I'd like to do it at the same time, if possible, when they are bringing it up to the altar. Sure, that would be fine. Again, yes. So what I will do, I acknowledge your question, and that would be fine. So as you come up to this altar, So I am just reiterating what's being said. So we can go up to the altar one at a time and then wait for the person to sit down before the next person comes up. Okay, if the two individuals who have already presented can come up to the altar. Actually, there are three objects right now on the, ta on the altar. Okay, so now, again, to clarify, what we will do, we will take turns. Someone will come up to the altar, explain, first introduce themselves, explain the object, and what that represents, just briefly. After that's been done, they will go hand that object over to the community of deafblind folks to be able to feel and touch it and understand what that is. clarifying question from the audience. So the person themselves can go over and give that object to the other group, yes. We want to make sure there's time for one person at a time and not everyone rushes up in a mass, <laughs> okay? Are you ready? Okay.
Can everyone see this? My name is Sabiva, England, like the country. I actually have three things I'd like to explain to you. The first object represents prayer. It's a figure of a hand, if you can see it. And its palm is facing up. It's a meditative gesture. Mudra. So we sign this in the Indian culture, within our dances and our art and theater. So my art is physical theater. Three years ago, my husband passed away. It was really unfortunate, very sad. I was grief stricken. I actually wanted to kill myself and not go on. But inside, I realized I want to perform, I want to make art again. And I started just to become more inspired and enlightened by this. I felt a connection to that object. So through physical art and physical theater, that helped me feel connected to other people. I felt the spirit, and that's the experience I wanted to share with you. So for me, I want to feel the connection with other people, and I do that through my art, through this art. Thank you. And the individuals in the audience are getting an understanding and feel for the specific objects. Hi, this is Alexandria again. We're going to continue with this process, and as we go on, we're going to really um, get to know each other, but I'll also our time is short, so I'm asking you to keep it a little bit brief and concise with your stories. They are unbelievable, beautiful stories to share, and during break time and other time throughout the day, you'll have t an opportunity to come and see what items are placed on the altar and what the connection is. They all represent all of you and we want to have everyone have a chance. So I know there's lots of questions that keep coming up, but I'm going to really manage and facilitate the time we have here. I'm Nikki Runch. Executive Director of Theater and Arts in Colorado. Imagine theater. This item that I have belonged to my daughter. This was at the same time I started embarking my imagine imagination theater and gave birth. Her name is Amber. as in fire. My daughter was fighting for her life at birth. 
and she continued as she was facing death. No matter what obstacle was uh, about to befall her, she continued to fight. And because of my daughter today, my daughter is three and very healthy. And so is my art. at the ASL Theater. They're taking a moment right now to just pass the item around among the attendants. Hi, I'm Amy. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I come from Seattle, Washington. The object I brought, that's me, a picture of me in this brochure, in this flyer. This is a part of a production associated with Deaf Spotlight. And before this event, I had no public speaking experience, acting experience, but I was really thrown into the fire. And I really thank uh, especially Patty and those in Deaf Spotlight who uh, gave me the courage to be where I am today, to be in that kind of production. Hello. I've been involved in theater for well over 18 years in all facets of theater, all sides of production, in front of and behind the curtain. Um, I brought with me one piece that has inspired me. Uh, again, we bring up the name Deaf Spotlight. This is a play poster in which it really invested into deaf playwrights, uh, several deaf playwrights. Uh, their content was gathered and exhibited uh, to a general audience with the goal of sustaining exposure to this kind of work, to the capability of uh, finding our kind of work, a full platform to be fully produced. Uh, and these were a series of short plays that allowed deaf playwrights to be empowered uh, and this hadn't been done for decades. And for decades, there have been deaf playwrights. You know, we think about Willie Conley and, uh, oh my goodness, who else? Um, Stephen Baldwin. Uh, oh goodness, others. <laughs> See, the, the issue I'm trying to remember. So there are so many playwrights. Dave Kurtz, I can go on. Although the number is relatively small, we're trying to expand <laughs> those kinds of efforts by those pl uh, playwrights and uh, make sure that we grow, grow the work. So that's my piece. Oh, my name is, uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. His, <laughs> he, he, did I say that right? He. The previous speaker was Ryan Schlett. The 
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is J.W. Guido. Pronouns are he, him, his. I'm the artistic director of the New York Deaf Theater. I'm an actor. The entire catalog of theater production. Uh, my artifact is a DVD. Looking back when I was younger, some of the things that inspired me most was the work of Peter Cook. I learned so much from Peter Cook. He's a role model, person I look up to. So this is my artifact. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Tyrone Giordano. He, him, his are my pronouns. I'm from DC. And my object is not here. It's in the hotel room, <laughs> but, but, but. I do have a placeholder for it. <laughs> but I do promise to bring it to the altar tomorrow. Uh, so the object was, is, uh, something associated to 2001 when I hosted a theatrical event, uh, part of a theatrical event, Big River, uh, was in a small space, very small theater, but it did end up getting touring engagements all over the world as far as Japan, amazing experience, but what was rich for me was uh, two things that happened, one of which um, was the fact that I made it there, you know, got to that level of professional theater. But that's a kind of once-in-a-lifetime event. And I thought and thought that I don't want it to be a once-in-a-lifetime event. I want something like that experience to have a legacy and be sustained. So uh, I brought a piece of that experience with me that I have a bookmark for. Hi, all you beautiful people out there. I'm Joey Cavalry. Him, his, he are my pronouns. I'm an actor, a director, a dazzle, an advocate, and many other professions. I have a picture of children of a lesser God. And I was in that cast. And that was on Broadway. That was a huge accomplishment for me. It made history for deaf people to be on Broadway. So we're going to do that again. And then it happened again. So I brought that artifact with me. Here it is. Thank you. Uh, about 10 years ago, I produced a play for the very first time, and um, I loved it. 
and it led to my eventual journey to becoming a theater administrator. Now I work for Deaf West Theater. Um, I am new to signing and new to the deaf community, so I will thank you in advance for your patience and apologize for my terrible signing, um, and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Hello, my name is Aaron Kelstone. I'm from Rochester, New York, from the National Theater of the Deaf. Artistic program designer. My pronouns are he, him, and his. My artifact is a pencil drawing. This is a piece of artwork from the National Theater of the Deaf. It was the first professional community, deaf community, I was involved there. That's where I met Sonny Matthew, who was a writer and an artist. Aaron is from NTID, National Technical Institute for the Deaf, in Rochester, New York. Hello everyone, my name is Wayne Betts Jr. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm the founder of Convo VRS. And my artifact is this. I wish this was real. It's from the National Theater of the Deaf. It's a key. I was actually responsible. So it was an artistic theater, and behind where they worked everything out was art. And today, that key is the only thing I have of it. And it belonged to Bonnie McLee. Uh, hi, my name is Sarah Bowden, and I'm a hard of hearing playwright and pretty new to sign, so thanks for your patience. Um, my artifacts, uh, the last hearing aid I got. 
I never wrote about hearing stuff, uh, and uh, I got this hearing aid in grad school while I was studying playwriting, and people were asking me about it, and I realized that people actually want to hear about this stuff. It's not just a part of my life, but that playwriting can help communicate this experience and bring people in. So the uh, hearing aid was the inspiration for that. And uh, it's in a plastic bag, so just for sanitation reasons, so just heads up. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Richard Costas. I am, uh, I am deaf, but I was raised hearing, so my sign language isn't as fluent as I would like it to be. I brought with me today a book of theater history, but I didn't bring it because it is a book of theater history. I brought it because in 2006, I wrote something in here that has motivated me in everything I've done in theater since then. I went, into, I went to a m very mainstream school and I took an acting course and my acting teacher told me, you should quit theater because theater is not accepting of people with unique characteristics. I am the kind of person that takes, likes to take something negative and turn it into a positive. So I've used that as my motivation ever since then just to prove someone wrong because there's nothing that motivates me more than someone telling me I can't do something. Thank you. This is my object. Hello. I'm Kaylin Feeney. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm from Portland, Oregon. And this item is special for me. I joined the National Theater of the Deaf summer program it was a professional theater program where I got to meet so many actors and I was there on a one month ex excursion. Bernard Bragg, Michael Lamatola, and many others. And one day I was sitting with Bernard Bragg and there's a story that I'll share with you about that pen at a later time on break. But it's very symbolic for me because also I am a writer besides being an actress. And it's got a nice flow to it when I'm utilizing it. It's not so stiff and awkward. And it helps me when I do my creative work. Hello, I'm Patty. 
I'm from Seattle, and I'm wonder, one of the founders of Deaf Spotlight Theater and uh, one of the coordinators of this event. I believe that art and artistic work, uh, whether it be in film, theater, conventional theater, or otherwise, or any visual art, uh, actually I have some friends here in the audience who are also my colleagues in visual art and producing uh, so much work. Inside jokes there, we have a special relationship, some special reflections, but I have a piece here that was from one of those great relationships, this t-shirt that I'm passing to my peers here in the audience. Hi, my name is Kayla. I work out of DC. And my object is also left behind at the hotel. But what I brought with me was my script. It was my first experience in deaf theater at the National Theater of the Deaf. I was in a mainstream program. I attended theater a lot. You know. And had to do a lot of speech therapy. And I really could never go back to that. But when I went to see the National Theater of Death, it was a new inspiration for me. <laughs> but I don't have an object to show everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Monique Holt. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And my object <laughs> is this. Uh, why I bring this object, this light, is because I value light. I'm from a deaf family. Sign language and well-lit communication uh, is always critical to me. But I remember in high school, I remember Eric Malkoons told me that my sign language was awful. You'll never be an actor. Nobody will ever come to see your work. And you're telling me this from a deaf family? And he brought me to tears. But at the same time, it impacted me in such a way that I wanted to pursue more quality and fluidity in my sign style. So I actually have to thank that criticism, that critique. So I put the spotlight on the good things and a spotlight on the things that need to be changed or that are worthy of change. Put a spotlight on it. Previous reference was to Malkun Kun. Hello, I'm Annie, Annie Wiegand. I'm from Iowa, but my primary focus in terms of artwork is uh, as a lighting designer. I've worked in Deaf theater as an assistant lighting designer, as lead lighting designer, uh, the gamut. My object is this book. The Theater of Dramatic Vision. This book is a book written by several designers and the designers uh, this was the content I studied in grad school at Boston University, go BU. Um, so it brings me really back home. I have so many roots here. My grad school time here uh, was a shift to me from undergrad to grad school. It was a time in which I was trying to explore what I was going to do for work. And there was a big shift with me because I decided to 
become a designer and be that kind of producer. This was the moment when things became clear for me. Hello, everyone. I hope you didn't cut my head off. Can everyone see it? All right. My name is Fred, Fred Beam. And this is my sign name. Professionally, I'm a professional actor and an artist. But this is my other sign name because of my braids <laughs> and my dreadlocks. I'm currently working as an outreach coordinator for Sunshine 2.0, formerly known as Sunshine 2. Oh, oh. But that is no longer in existence. But it revitalized itself again, and I brought it back to life. And it is alive and up and running again. Just like the iPhone 1, the iPhone 2, you get it? All right. So my background is, takes place over 30 years. Traditionally, I'm an actor. I never stop. But my object that I'm bringing today is this keychain. And it says Michael. The name Michael is on this keychain. Remember I said? Fred Beam is my name. I added Michael because that's my father's name. And I wanted it separate because I have my own identity. But yet I hold it dear to my heart because Michael is the person who changed my life. Michael Jackson. You all know that. He was the one who's inspired me to become an actor. But everyone said I couldn't be one. And later... I read a scripture out of the Bible, and there's a song there that says, Michael rode the boat ashore, hallelujah. And I thought about that, and I thought I would use that theme to change my life to get into theater. And the first person that pulled me into theater was Jerome Cushman from National Theater to Deaf. And he saw my interest and took me under his wings. And the rest is history. And this here represents who I am. And there's a figure of a heart there a, and a musical note. Don't forget to put your object there. <laughs> you walked away with a <laughs> You didn't leave it on the altar. Great. Hello, everyone. I'm Andrew Morell from Illinois. If you don't know... <laughs> where the specific town in Illinois is, which I had named uh, just a moment ago. Uh, you can approach me. My pronouns are he, he, him, his. And here's my object. It's a piece of a birch tree. You know the production, the Shakespearean production, Midsummer Night's Dream, right? Where's Ethan? Okay, Ethan, right. Ethan, of course you know that. Midsummer Night's Dream. I remember the closing night of Gallaudet, at this production at Gallaudet University. 
And on this piece uh, is the word dream written there. And I always use that as a reminder that as an artist, you should be a dreamer. But we are already dreamers, not should be a dreamer. It's not an aspiration. We are here. We're in the dream. So being here is a part of a dream fulfilled. Hello, and my name is Albert Joseph. You can call me EJ. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm local. I'm from Boston. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. I brought this. Mm-hmm. A boot. Why am I bringing a boot? First of all, there is a production called The Wear Trilogy. If you're unfamiliar with it, Susan Zader was the playwright of The Wear Trilogy. Maybe you're familiar with uh, Mother Hicks, A Taste of Sunrise, or The Edge of Peace. All three of those productions uh, were produced here in Boston. Uh, one of the productions was here in the Paramount Theater space. Uh, the other in Wheelock Family Theater, uh, and the third at the Central Square Theater Company. I performed the role of Tuck. So I'd like to thank uh, the fact that this piece exists, and I'd like to thank that character, Tuck, because the day that I put on that character, the character told me to consider which shoe I should wear to do the work. We got a long journey ahead of us. It's going to be a long walk, and who knows when the journey will end, but you keep on walking. And that's what we should do in terms of our legacy. Put our shoes on every day, get up with the right attitude, empower others, spread the wealth, whether it's a deaf community, hearing community, or otherwise, I thank you all for being here. Hi everyone, I'm Shauna. And I see all these people bringing their artifacts. How can I compete with that? Well, the object that I brought is a photo journal with Deaf Access Theater. I was a teenager. That was in DC where I grew up. In those times, I was a student. And I was in a mixed group of teenagers between 20 and 27. I was in deaf theater at the time. I was hanging with other people who were deaf and hearing. And at that time, a lot of the hearing peers really wanted to learn sign language. And that inspired me to become an actor. And then on a teacher and so forth. Now that theater company, unfortunately, no longer exists. But at that time, it was important because I've learned about the importance of education through theater to, you. to the youth. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
I'm Amelia Hensley, and I'm from God knows where. I've been everywhere. <laughs> I'm such a traveler and migrant. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and my object is this. It's a button. It says, got drama. And right at the very bottom, it says, Gallaudet Theater Department. Before going to the Gallaudet Theater Department, I was often told that theater was not the way to go in terms of a career. There's no prospect out there in terms of theater and arts, and it's just a hobby, essentially. And I believed that for a time until that button. I didn't realize that was actually an academic course, a major. And that was the moment of shift. That's when it changed my life. Being a part of the Gallaudet Theater Department and seeing faculty and staff, professionals, practitioners, do the work and get subsidized for it, get paid for it, that's when the shift was. So that's why this means so much to me. Hello everyone, my name is Natasha, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And my object is this silver star. I was just married three weeks ago, and this is part of the decorations for my wedding. It represents many things to me, friends and family, courage, light, love, and I brought that here to share that among all of you, to share my love and my strength with each and every one of you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Brian, Brian Chelsick. I'm in Austin, Texas, and I'm in theater. I'm a co-director for Dep Austin. Austin Theater. I work with a lot of them, an artistic interpreter for the deaf. And I study on deaf studies, and I focus on a minor in theater as well. And I'm pursuing currently my PhD. And what I brought with me is something from my high school year when I was mainstreamed. At that time, I was involved in theater. I was meeting people, making friends, and I was growing. My artistic director passed away 13 years ago, and I always remember him. Because when I entered his program, he had so much patience to work with me because I was the only deaf student in his class. And he accommodated me. And he gave me the opportunity. And he gave me a lead role. And this script that I've used back then was in my graduation year in 1999, out of the blue gray, brown, it still, you know, has its titles. It has everything in there, and I cherish this script. I learned so many things from my director. And today, I teach theater, and I use his philosophy and his approach to inspire other students, because what he gives me, I pass it forward.
My name is Bellamy. I'm from Ohio. I'm an actress, producer, director, writer, and one of the founders of the Deaf Austin Theater. Here is my object. It's a mouse on cheese. Perhaps you've read Who Moved My Cheese, that book. Well, the book is unforgettable to me. Not exclusively because of the management philosophy that you can glean from the book, uh, but also it signifies my journey as an actress, writer, producer, playwright, etc. cetera. Um, it helped me found the Deaf Austin Theater. Uh, it helps you aspire for change, look for change, and create change. Also to accept change, to emerge, and parrot access. Hello, I am Michelle Banks. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm from DC, and I've brought with me this. You may ask, what is this? My hair, my locks. Uh, I did a one woman show uh, some time ago uh, as an artistic director of uh, uh, Onyx Theater in New York, I produced a play called For Colored Girls Contemplating Suicide When the Rainbow Wasn't Enough, written by the late Nataki Shange. I also produced a production about Toussaint Louverture, in those experience, I reflect on my journey as a writer and producer of a one-woman show, and those pieces inspired me to adapt my journey and adapt my vision to be more considerate of the ebony vision. So I decided to bring this piece to represent my love, my ebony journey, Bob Marley, and I've told the individuals who have inspired me, in fact, the playwright who I just mentioned earlier, I'd met and I'd mentioned that she had inspired me. So all of those pieces are significant tokens of inspiration that have inspired me and brought me here today, and I bring it to you. Notaki Shange. Okay, I think I'm ready. Hmm. I'm so nervous. <laughs> oh my God. My name is Irvin. My name is Irvin. And my pronouns are he, his, and him. 
duly noted. And the thing that I brought with me today was this old shoe. It was a shoe that was given to me from my grandfather. He was a dancer. And I used that shoe because it reminds me of my grandfather who passed away. And through my journey in D.C., I got into a scholarship program. And at that time in D.C., I was coming in from Louisiana. And I then lived in Maryland. And I danced my way all the way through <coughs> until I met Tim. from a traveling theater company that traveled all across the United States. Now this individual, Tim, it says, why don't you do a one-man show? And I said, me? I'm a dancer. And he said, well, that doesn't matter. Why don't you at least think about it? So I thought about it, and I said, why not? So Michelle, my director, Michael, my director, had some dialogue with me. We discussed it. And the ballet shoe had no identity until I used the white shirt. So in my work, I started to consider how can I use dance, these objects, to represent not exclusively dance, but multimedia or multiple objects of art. How do I use what things can be seen? How can I use my smile? How can I use icons such as a butterfly and freedom, my identity of being open and out? How can I change everyone's life to be fabulous and representative? I bring all kinds of pieces together, not just one. Hello, everyone. I'm Jill Bradbury from Gallaudet. I'm a faculty member there. I've brought this, this brochure is from the Visual Shakespeare Festival uh, that was produced uh, last year um, as a part of the national tour, uh, Shakespeare celebration and recognition of the 400th anniversary of his passing. I look at that piece as the first time that I had really immersed myself into deaf theater, let alone Shakespeare in American Sign Language. Uh, and that it was revolutionary to me, historical to me, significant to me, especially in relation to all that we've lost in the deaf theater community that goes undocumented, that goes without being passed on. So within this piece, I'd like to honor Steve Baldwin. Steve Baldwin is an actor, historian, a person who had not published a book about deaf theater history, but always had images of him in NTD publications, of course. So there's such a legacy there, and we are accountable to continue the legacy and that history and pass it on. 
literally within our bodies over the years. So I want to honor his work in the way that he honored the legacy of deaf theater and deaf history to maintain that history and sustain it. So thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Josh Romulus. Romulus. Born in Pennsylvania, I currently live in Oregon. I'm one of the co-founders. Of the theaters group. Protactal theater. My colleague here to my right also helped me co-found that theater. Hi, my name is Jasper. And I am from New York City. And I also am the co-founder of Protactile Theater. And the object that I brought is a metal star. Made by an artist from the Pro Tactile Theater. And this star we've carried throughout our productions. It was handmade. And it represents the community that is in within us, regardless of our background regardless of what community we come from, because we are all in one community, the theatrical community. And my personal object is a pocket watch. This old pocket watch has Braille on it. And it is very rich and symbolic for me, from my own personal experience. Why? Because it teaches me a lot, not only about being deaf blind, but also for me on a personal level, when I do my self-assessment of who I am and how I can come across to other people that I meet. I never thought that I would be where I am today in the deaf pro tactile theater. After my graduation from college, I knew that I wanted to have fun in my work. And being deaf blind, People said that I couldn't do these things. And I was frustrated, but yet I had dreams like everyone else. And my dream was to be in theater. 
And to have people say that I couldn't, and I figured that I would be able to find a way. And so I needed to find allies, partners who would buy into my dream and to share this vision that I had through ProTactile and through Braille. And once I collaborated with my peers, it was just the same way that you tell time on a watch. This tells us story of us who are deaf blind, that our way of communication can be utilized in theater through tactile and pro-tactile. That is the philosophy we use as we bring it to theater. To adapt scripts in pro-tactile mm -hmm. and braille. And once people started to realize that they can access our play through braille, pro-tactile, we would see the people's reaction. They were awed, inspired, and they were pleasantly happy that they can access theater directly through our language. Hi everyone, I'm Robert. I prefer he with a small, not capital he, <laughs> H. Very humble about it, so his is also okay to identify me. I am so thrilled to join all of you. I don't have a lot of background in theater training, but I was involved as an actor often, and I had different majors, but I got so involved with SSP work and, I deci and how I utilized space in that setting. The architectural design is something I got totally immersed in I wanted to make sure it was fully accessible and deaf and deafblind friendly. I wanted to make sure there was meaning to everything that happened on that stage. People understood what the goal was, what we were representing and what we wanted them to see. We wanted people to understand our deaf space. And through the experience that we shared in the theater with the real world, we found that this was both interchangeably. What uses, what's used in the real world is used on theater, and what's used on theater can be utilized in the real world. We bring this to the stage, and I extrapolated that from where I grew up as a kid on a farm. Now, for 200 years, my family were farmers, and unfortunately, the farming is gone, and we no longer have that farm. And I remember where my father used to work on a farm, and I would work on the farm alongside my father, and we would sell our crops. And the one item that I kept connected to my family's history from working on that farm was one item. Of all the things of that farm, I only have one item in my possession. This. You probably don't know what it is. It's an inkwell for writing. My great-grandfather, who was deaf, he was an educator. And then there were priests in my family who were also educators. And they valued the importance of reading and writing. And he explained to me that this inkwell was handmade. He would go to the farm, 
and he would make that inkwell from pottery, weld it, mold it, and then put the ink in there. And I thought, wow, the meaning behind this, it gave me a new meaning. Tools, tools have new meaning for me. So I brought this here, tools of the trade. Hello everyone, I'm Ethan Sennett. I've been a deaf e theater artist, uh, worn many hats, primarily in directing and design. I'm the head of the artistic theater department at Gallaudet University. Uh, I was initially mainstreamed as the only deaf student in the program uh, in some odd spaces, uh, you might say spaces in which I was not necessarily accepted by either group in that I had been educated in deaf space as well as mainstream space. Uh, always looking for a place to fit, a common space, and when I didn't find that fit in one space that I had an identity of, I would go to another. So I've brought to you a bit of both of those spaces. The first space exhibit from one space is from a competition, a speaking competition. Uh, it was a poetry speaking lecture competition that I discovered through an English class that was posted uh, on a board in the hallway. And as I passed by, I saw this bit of marketing material for this speaking poetry Shakespeare competition. And I thought to myself, well, what am I going to do? <laughs> you know, who am I going to call? And if I were to call somebody, they're going to hang up on me because obviously I'm going to call through the TTY. And would they permit signing in this competition? Would they pers <laughs> allow ASL? I mean, who were, th who was the audience going to be, and how would I fit and make this piece work? So. I asked if I could call in and sign my piece. I got no resistance. So there was an opportunity. I won for that region. I went to New York City, competed there in front of a large audience of significant people from across the country. And I got the second place to the top level. And that, for me, told me of the possibilities of the initial vision that I had about being an actor and the ability to continue to progress toward that goal. Which leads me to talk about my second artifact, this experimental piece that I worked on at La Jolla Playhouse in LA. It was an apprenticeship that was associated with there. That program at the time was in association with Steppenwolf Theater Company. So I worked with that cohort quite a bit for several weeks. It was an intensive program. And there were circumstances in that intensive program that came up in which there was a need for a deaf artist, a young deaf artist, an emerging early career artist. So looking back, I see all of those points, those milestones, as the reason why I'm here today, in which I had opportunities to be pushed to articulate Shakespeare in sign language and not necessarily through traditional means such as speech. But if I wanted a role, some folks said that I had to do the traditional way, and I just didn't find that acceptable. 
but I'm proud to be who I am and that I've never conceded to the expectations of others, to certain speech coaches who wanted me to do things a certain way and to present a certain way, a large, verbose text. which was not necessarily my dream or the way that I wanted to represent myself in front of large audiences. The end result was that general audiences thought that this was great work, even though I was using my voice and compromised there for a moment and people thought that I was articulate it still didn't sit well with me. I wanted autonomy, I wanted creative control, I wanted to design and produce things my way that set well with my intention so that I did not compromise. So these objects represent that journey, it represents why I'm here and how I got here as a deaf artist, as an art maker uh, who creates opportunities to do it the natural way, the way that people want. The way people want to be represented, I want to support that. Wow, amazing. So inspiring, just watching all of you. We're gonna take a bit of a break right now. Get up, stretch, take a bathroom break, get some food, nourishment. At 2.40, remember that time. Well, three o'clock, because it's about 2.40 now. At three o'clock, we're gonna go get together for a group picture. So go refresh yourself, and we'll take the picture in the lobby. Then we're going to come back here and continue with our plan for this afternoon. Okay, so right now, we're going to keep moving. All the artifacts are right here. We're going to put them, we're going to move them aside for now. So you have a 20-minute break right now. And we, of course, we do have a question. So our staff will lead you and guide you to wherever you need to go, okay? To the restrooms, to the lobby area. You can ask staff and they'll lead you. A question from the audience. Is it okay to leave our things in the room while we go out for break? And the answer is absolutely yes. Okay? All right, take a break. We're good. See you in the lobby at what time? Three o'clock, that's right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 